All right, welcome back to another episode of Rockford Reading Daily. I believe this is episode 52, and we are on chapter 6 of Citizens, Cops, and Power. All right, bottom of page 142. Give me one second, let me make sure the mic volume is good. Yeah, yeah, all right. <clears throat> on the state-society relation. I have been at pains to establish that there is no simple means by which the state-society relation should be pursued. That is because different modes of that relation possess legitimacy. These modes can coexist peacefully. Certainly, the protection of individual and group liberties is essential for any modicum of democratic activity. Subservience and separation are therefore necessarily twinned. Yet conflict between these modes is unavoidable. In the, in the case of the police, the drive to hold officers subservient to citizen input is frequently thwarted by the police's ability to remain separate and by de their generative practices. Importantly, the police maintain their separation more through their adherence to internally defined norms of professional conduct than through their loyalty to the legal code. Whatever merit attends to professional authority, its assertion can reduce the extent of citizen oversight. Similarly, the frames the police use to structure citizen input often yield citizen frustration, a commonly held belief that residents cannot make themselves heard as they desire. There is no magical resolution to the dilemma posed by conflicting paths to legitimate state society relations. Yet this does not mean that the dilemma should escape our continued attention. In fact, it is precisely the lack of a resolution that mandates such attention. Certainly, no single path should capture our unalloyed allegiance because each possesses shortcomings. The single-minded pursuit of subservience fails prey to the well-grounded liberal complaint about the potential excess of majority rule. Similarly, a state agency that takes refuge behind separation may find its legitimacy challenged. Resolute adherence to the legal code may frustrate citizen groups that expect a more flexible response. The preservation of professional authority can unjustifiably stiff-arm citizen oversight. In addition, the ways in which the state generates community also deserve perpetual examination. State policies that deeply affect urban neighborhoods need to be measured against ideals of justice, fairness, and equity, especially if we expect localized groups to assume responsibility for asserting a political voice. The practices by which state agencies apprehend those citizen voices, while unavoidable, can be overly restrictive filters. And the moral discourse that state actors invoke, also unavoidable, can similarly mute citizen input. At the same time, we cannot do without any of these articulations of the state-society relation. The norm of democracy is so well established that some evidence of its perpetuation is necessary for state legitimacy. Citizens rightly expect a responsive state. Similarly, they rightly expect the state to be checked in its exercise of power. State actors must be accountable to legal rules and to right-bearing citizens. And state actors will continue to construct and defend professional norms for regulating their conduct. Because such norms can improve efficiency and performance, they are not necessarily problematic. Further, the state cannot help but generate community. It will continue to construct policies that deeply impact urban neighborhoods, to use bureaucratic routines to apprehend citizen input, and to develop moral justifications for its actions. It is therefore unproductive to suggest that any of these three modes of state-society relation deserve absolute priority over another. Our political attention should focus instead on the particular expression of these modes and the balance between them. We can sensibly query whether state agencies like the police do or do not respond to citizen suggestions, whether they are or are not constrained by legal regulations. We can assess their professional practices both to determine their effectiveness and to assess whether their expression illegitimately constricts public oversight. We can ask whether an overly robust moralism allows state agencies to elevate their actions beyond the pale of assessment. Further, we can wonder whether the state's moral desire to protect its citizenry should not extend beyond the crusade-like quest to apprehend and incarcerate criminal, quote, predators, end quote. A moral case can be easily made to suggest that the state, as well, should ensure basic levels of economic security. <clears throat> 
Indeed, such a commitment to the less advantaged is under sustained attack in these neoliberal times. With the economic market the increasingly hegemonic metaphor for structuring social and political relations, citizens are seen primarily as free economic agents expected to ensure their own survival with minimal support. If they do approach the state, they are more likely to be viewed as clients than as citizens. Perhaps they will receive limited services, but their political agency will likely not be recognized. The pervasiveness of market-based individualism stands as an obvious contrast to nostalgic visions of communal togetherness and political capability, and it is a glaring contradiction of neoliberal discourse that it often trumpets both simultaneously. My larger point is that the state's moralism is an inescapable fact, regardless of the ideal of liberalism that the state remain as neutral as possible. Yet the form of the state's moral framework remains susceptible to change, even though it is often situated on a transcendental plane ostensibly beyond critique. The state's moral framework and the power accorded it deserve perpetual questioning. It would be simpler, of course, to find some Archimedean point upon which one could situate the ideal state-society connection. Yet such a quest is fruitless. There will always be tension between these modes of relation, always be a charged politics about their content and their competition. Our obligation is less to locate an ideal in state than to monitor the balance continually and strive towards some basic degree of equilibrium. In the case of the police, the politics of the state society connection will be especially fervent because of the coercive power officers possess. At present, the evidence suggests that the balance is not ideal, that the police lie rather too far beyond the reach of citizen oversight. Further, Community policing is a poor vehicle through which a better balance can be struck. Because police so resist informal oversight, they need to be held accountable through more formal bodies. Citizens need sufficient means by which they can raise questions about the police operations. Although the police should be granted some deference, they must also confront clear limits on their authority. These limits must be imposed by legal regulations and enforced by independent bodies and police morality must be checked to ensure that it does not legitimate questionable actions. Indeed, the police's capacity to construct crime in highly moralized language and thereby to cast their own actions as unassailable deserves ongoing suspicion. Otherwise, officers can, er excuse me, otherwise, officers can arrogate to themselves a degree of power that is unacceptable in ostensibly democratic societies. In this ongoing political struggle over the state-society connection, it is questionable whether, quote, community, end quote, should play a central role to which issue I now turn. Okay, that brings us to the end of that passage in, the, in the, this chapter. And I think that uh, the thing that stands out to me the most in that passage, again, is just the the uh, onus that the author puts on trying to find a balance between uh, the amount of power that the uh, police have and the amount of power that uh, the community have and citizens have uh, within the community and that uh, there is a, the scales are tipped far too, uh, are skipped far too, that the, the scales are skipped far too much in the way of the institution of policing and not enough uh, is put, uh, not enough power is put in the hands of the citizenry. Uh, and so on that note, I'm going to end this segment here. Not going to end the episode, just going to end this segment and then start back up and we'll finish up this last chapter in this book. All right. All right. Let's pick back up where we left off at. On the middle of page 145. On the political status of community. It is easy to understand the persistent longing for community. That is because community promises so much. Togetherness, support, cooperation, care, compassion, friendship. No social institution can provide these in quite the same way. Certainly, the state cannot do it. In an increasingly mobile and tenuous world, the allure of a secure anchor is irresistible. In her extensive interviews with volunteer activists, Nina Ellisoff witnessed this allure. Quote, Almost everyone I met harbored intense nostalgia for the warm, totally enveloping community. 
They all ambivalently recognize that without anything thicker than moral minimalism holding anyone together, life could be lonely and dangerous. The promise of localized democracy is similarly seductive. Grassroots empowerment is easy to desire and to support. It is thus not surprising that programs like community policing galvanize such strong enthusiasm from across the political spectrum. These hopes for community are sometimes realized. Projects done in the name of community can work to improve the life circumstances of urbanites, even those in neighborhoods of disadvantage. Yet assessments of community politics suggest that these successes are not typical, that urban neighborhoods only rarely approximate the social and political ideals many hold out for community. Certainly, none of the neighborhoods I studied in West Seattle do, for the reasons I delineated. Because these realities exist across American cities, my cautionary tale about the unrealized hopes for community deserves consideration when approaching projects like community policing. In fact, the seductiveness of localized democracy should not blind us to its very real downsides. The devolution of power towards smaller units can work to increase inequality both within and across groups. Within groups, there exists always the possibility that the more valuable and energetic members of a small faction can dominate the discussion and push an agenda that is not widely supported. Across groups, certain community organizations typically possess greater political skills than others and can thereby prosper when there is competition between groups for government resources. Because neighborhoods of higher economic standing are more likely to harbor members with political acumen, devolution of political authority can thereby increase the social and economic gaps between rich areas and poor ones. It can also decrease the possibilities for political alliances across social groups. If groups are perpetually in competition with one another, they may well find it difficult to forge coalitions. The devolution of authority can also frame problems as local when they are actually the result of dynamics generated at other scales. Because urban neighborhoods are shaped by regional, national, and international forces, perhaps it is misguided to expect much from local political organizations, regardless of their representativeness or seeming capability. If this is true, citizens might rightfully focus their political energies on national-level political groups, even if that means that they are increasingly, quote, bowling alone, end quote. Certainly, neighborhood political organizations that fail to connect their agendas to larger political dynamics stand little chance of seeing meaningful long-term change. One can therefore call into question the presumption that localized groups should take such extensive responsibility for ensuring their own economic and social security. Even the best organized of such groups can do little to affect broader dynamics. Communities of disadvantage face nearly impossible odds. This concern about increasing the degree of disadvantage is particularly, particularly regnant in those post-welfare neoliberal times. In these post-welfare neoliberal times. The extent of concentrated disadvantage in American cities remains exceedingly high. The political will to create a sense of collective interest exceedingly weak. The ideology of devolved authority can certainly sound sweet. Who, after all, wants to discourage local empowerment? But if localized politics obscure larger scale dynamics, if they render more difficult the creation of a public interest, then they deserve questioning. This is not to suggest that neighborhoods cannot and should not be the focus of political organizing. Because the problems that confront neighborhoods are immediate, they can often be a visible and direct reminder to citizens of the importance of political action. In the case of crime, Neighborhoods can work as a locus for the development of social capital and informal social control, both of which can help reduce crime and collective fear. But, as Clarence Stone and his associates note, social capital is different from civic capacity. In other words, the development of social connections to provide support and reciprocal assistance is not the same as the capacity to act effectively in the wider body politic. In short, Simply to devote authority to the, quote, community, end quote, without cognizance of the immense obstacles many urban neighborhoods face in gaining greater economic, social, and political equality confounds justice rather than promotes it. And then that brings us to the last segment here. And I, I want to point out that, to, again, this, this is one of the 
that those passages that we read there are some of the most powerful passages throughout the book. And I think it does a great job of illustrating just illustrating why certain neighborhoods and certain locales have not been able to create communities from those neighborhoods and locales and then thus have not been able to create power or build power for those communities in those neighborhoods and locales. And it is because of the dis the disadvantage that they are at both economically, uh, education, educationally, uh, and politically, and how being at a disadvantage economically and educationally uh, perpetuates being at a disadvantage politically. And so I, I think that is that is something that is important to articulate when speaking about why certain groups of people or why certain communities of people or why certain areas, certain neighborhoods have the same issues manifesting over and over again. And I think that, uh, again, uh, it's important to point out how those are the areas that deal with the negative aspects of policing more often than uh, than uh, other areas. And those are the communities that deal with the more negative aspects of policing more than other areas and, and so or more than other communities. And so one of the commonalities that I have done, he, I have tried to do here is to remove this some of the concepts that are in this book from just simply being uh, the, the deterrences or hindrances for community policing and, and and illustrated how they are deterrences and hindrances for the institution of policing as a whole. And I think that that passage right there does a great job of doing that. And also, I think that it, it, when you understand that, it points out how we can't simply put all these issues on the police. I don't want people to think that I am saying that the police are the root causes for all of these issues. There are root causes that are much bigger than the institution of policing. However, the institution of policing maintains the status quo that uh, that keeps us dealing with these root problems and these root causes. And as long as we are... Uh, putting put in so much of a concerted effort in, in a, uh, putting so much money and so much finances and so much energy and so much time into bolstering the police into the institution of policing and we aren't putting that time into creating new institutions that can deal with the root causes uh, we will never be able to adequately uh, address and absolve ourselves of uh, of quote unquote criminal activity or, or, or crime let's read through this last passage the unbearable lightness of community. Now here, I've known three drive-by shootings and I know all the kids that have been shot. That creates an awareness. But what can community really do to fix that? I'm not sure. Marshall, Centralia resident. Little that I learned in West Seattle offers much reason for optimism about the political power of community. Neighborhood groups rarely organize effectively, focus broadly, or attract much state attention. Although the pursuit of communal connections will not abate, these connections cannot typically bear much political weight. Our hopes for community as a means for generating political energy must always remain modest. As Marshall notes, community members possess minimal capacity to alter the dynamics of violent crime. This is especially the case if such violence can be traced ultimately to matters of economic and racial disadvantage. Community can, of course, exist as a central component of many people's lives. Urban citizens continue to seek connections of meaning, value, and support, both within and outside their neighborhoods. In many cases, these neighborhoods can possess a skine of relations capable of exerting informal social control sufficient to help reduce rates of crime. Certainly, as a core sociological and political concept, community is unlikely to disappear anytime soon. Yet we invested with significant political hopes at great potential peril. It would certainly be nice if one could conclude otherwise, if more romanticized notions of community togetherness and empowerment actually have more resonance and possibility. A more, a more clear eyed assessment points us in the opposite direction toward a necessary skepticism about the promise of community policing and other efforts to increase localized self-governance. Such an assessment makes clear that community cannot be expected to be a robust force for political action. It also reveals that community, in whatever form, cannot relate in any simple fashion to the police or any other component of the state. 
If the goals are to increase the political capacity of urban neighborhoods and to improve citizen oversight of state agencies like the police, community is unlikely to be an effective vehicle. For now, and for the foreseeable future, it is best to recognize that, all too often, community is unbearably light. And that brings us to the end of chapter six and the finishing of the book Citizens, Cops and Power, Recognizing the Limits of Community by Steve Herbert. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to dive too much into a reflection on the book in totality. I'm going to save that for the next episode. But what I do want to say is I think that the main thing that I have gained from this reading, which has been invaluable, is a deeper understanding of the concept of community a deeper understanding of the concept of uh, or a deeper understanding of the idea of the legitimate legitimacy or, or illegitimacy of the policing and the institution of policing, uh, a deeper understanding of hindrances that neighborhoods have and locales have when it comes to uh, transforming the root issues, the root causes that produce crime in those areas and and uh, and also uh, this again adds a, another uh, another piece in the puzzle of of articulating why we must have different institutions and different organizations uh, than we currently have to try to absolve uh, the issues that are facing us. And so I'm going to end this episode here. The next episode will be a, a reflection on the book Citizens, Cops, and Power. And then after that, we will begin reading Thoreau's, uh, David Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience, which will be a, a, a shorter read, but we will read that with a, another person present so it'll add another dynamic to it. And then after we finish reading uh, Henry Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience, I believe the next book we will read will be Angela Davis's Race, Women, and, and Class. All right. So I want to thank you for listening through Citizens, Cops, and Power and uh, participating in the, uh, the dialogue or the monologue, I guess, that has accompanied it. Uh, I want to encourage anybody who has not her previous episodes of Rafa Reading Daily. Please go back and listen to the previous episodes. If when this comes out, there are future episodes out, uh, please go out and listen to those future episodes. Please share this on whatever platform you're listening to it on. Uh, like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe on YouTube. Uh, follow us. What up, what up, man? Uh, follow us on uh, all those social media platforms. Uh, and again, we uh, put these episodes out on a daily basis to uh, provide people the avenue to uh, begin or to further their struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. Uh, all right, we outside.